So, I am here with, what was your name, sir? Jaka. Jaka. And uh, so you are definitely dressed for a night on the town in Austin. Absolutely. What, what game particularly are you dressed for? Well, I, I haven't played yet, but I'm, I'm really trying to get into doing DR, uh, uh, Dystopia Rising. Okay, so this would just be a general everyday look then, yeah? No, no, I just, I, I found out about it about a week ago, and I said I'm going to put an outfit together, and here it is. So you have done this in a week? Yes. I am impressed. <laughs> this is this is very good. I've been doing um, medieval reenactment for about 20 years. Uh, the Society for Creative Anachronisms. Okay. So I mean, I mean, I've got a little bit of a costuming background. Um, I also do uh, lightsaber combat and build custom lightsabers. So, very nice. Yeah. So I just, I kind of just, I love doing things. Ooh, that crafting. Allows me to immerse myself in something. Yeah. Right. So what what do you look forward to in a game of Dystopia Rising? Um, it's immersive. It's uh, it's a whole weekend long. Um, where, you know, zombies can attack, raiders can attack, like, you know, you're always doing something, and, and it just seems, seems really like a lot of fun, and I like the whole post-apocalyptic genre of it, so. Nice, and uh, so coming out here, aside from dystopia, were you aware of the plethora of other LARPs and games that are out here? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was aware that it was kind of a LARPing meet and greet situation. Um, I used to play Vampire way back in the day. Okay, so you had done some LARPing I've done a before, LARPing but LARPing background. It's just, it's been a while. And I know sometimes when you say SCA and the word LARP, some people freak and some people right. say yes, yes, it is. It's not really a LARP, yeah. Right. But um, you know, in some aspects, you're you're dressed up different and you're doing something exactly. different. So. Exactly. What? Uh, so, crafting seems to be a big thing with you. What? Um, what are the favorite parts of what you've done so far in, in getting this all together? I don't know. I mean, it just kind of threw everything together. Like, I had a bunch of um, deer bones. I I brew for a hobby, okay. and uh, one of my buddies hunts deer, and that's like how he feeds himself for the year. So we have a thing that we do with each other. We call it Deers for Beers. And so I give him homebrew beer, and he gives me deer bones and, and deer meat. So I just I had all these deer bones, and I was like, oh, I'm going to throw them together in a costume. And I had the wolf fur from, from SCA. And that, that sounds pretty much like you're already living the, the dystopia rising I lifestyle. I kind of do. I'm kind of a modern tribal anyway, so. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Face tattoos and, you know, so. <laughs> I definitely wish you well at, uh, at dystopia rising. Here on the show, uh, our last season, uh, we just had a, a show about dystopia, so um, I hear it's a, it's a fun time. Yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked about it. I'm, I'm looking forward to playing. All right. Thanks for your time. Right on. No problem. Adventures of LARP fans, uh, welcome to another show. I'm Chris Glover with Courtney Manor, and today we are joined by Gual, 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 Gual Feywolf, who happens to be a fey, hence the name. So we are having a whole show dedicated to fey, or fairy, for those who haven't played enough D&D. And um, yeah. <laughs> Gual here has played a little too much fairy. So, so we're going to talk, the, first off when we're talking here, uh, let's talk some about playing fairy in game. And, and specifically, how, what are the things that we can do, or people out there can do, to really get across a fairy character different of other races? Well, uh, first I would definitely say do your research. Okay. Always look up the lore. Look up what is a uh, evil fairy? What's a good fairy? What do they do? What's the characteristics? How do they live? What does our modern day think of them? And what did people back then think of them? Okay, o or still today, because mm -hmm. we still have fey. And, and even then, we, we traditionally think of fey in a fantasy or medieval-ish type genre. But then when you look at the RPG world and things like uh, Shadowrun and things like that, you've got fey in a modern or future modern type setting. Mm -hmm. a and then you look at things like uh, Warhammer, and you've got Eldar, even though that's not really a LARP, but you still have Fae in, in, in other settings as well. Um, w when you're, once you've done some research and you kind of know some of the back history, what kinds of things do you do as a character to really bring out fairy? 
Well, I would definitely say, um, think of a few things. Do you want to be more the wild and crazy one and move around and just be very wiry? Or do you want to be the superior one and just be alone? Hi. <laughs> we're, we're losing our guests here. <laughs> what? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a distraction. <laughs> <sighs> Darling. Hmm. So, all right, all right. Um, Fade into the post. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, but, but throwing as well. I mean, I, when, I guess whenever I've done uh, any sorts of role playing, I don't know that I've really gone and, and portrayed a fairy character. I definitely haven't done it very well. Um, you've done some role playing before as well, right? Oh, yeah. uh, even though not as much on the LARP side. But mm -hmm. what what kinds of uh, what kinds of fae have you played over time? A fae. Um, with the exception of one elf in D and D, most of it has been kind of dwarven. But then again. I've got dwarven right. ancestry, most specifically. Yes, I look all sparkly and pretty, but underneath all this, there is a dwarf living at heart. But coming from a personal side... So you're side, an automaton with a dwarf inside. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, how the show it suddenly <laughs> took a weird turn. <laughs> no, but um, coming from a personal standpoint, however, I'm pagan, as some of you may have guessed. So fey folk are very prominent in my folklore. Okay. Maybe not quite as exuberant as this, as this guy, but definitely pretty close, especially the Irish Fae. And something that we're going to talk about later is the Unseelie and the Seelie Court. Ooh. Okay. Well, so let's, let's we'll get to the Unseelie <laughs> and Unseelie. But <laughs> well, we're still talking about, um, we'll, as we're talking about doing some research and things, I know that there are bits of, of fairy in a variety of lore. Uh, oh, yes. Nordic fairy and, mm -hmm. and Irish fairy and European all the way through uh, yep. Oriental type thing. What are some of the characteristics that seem to be similar across that scream fairy? I would definitely say the mischievousness that um, definitely follows the characteristics of any kind of fae. Uh, every fae that um, I've played or I've had other friends play, I've always seen there's something mysterious and something very mischievous about that, that, that character. And you want to get to know that character because of that. That's, what is that secret that they're holding? And why are they playing those tricks on people? Mm -hmm. Fae and folklore are very mischievous. Whether you've got uh, the Arabian Jinn, which are a type of fae folk, you've got, um, of course, the Irish courts, who are very well-known tricksters. You've got <laughs> Pan from uh, Greek mythology and even onto Bacchus and the dryads and the naiads, uh, the satyr, yeah, Kronos, satyrs and fauns, which are uh, other types of fae folk, which are really, really interesting from Greece. I think okay. they're actually the more popular kind of fae that mm -hmm. a lot of people that you see like to dress up as, like if they go to a Renaissance fair or a cosplay, mm -hmm. there's, it's just the part, per, uh, part human to part uh, satyr goat is just beautiful. I just really enjoy it. Yeah, so very playful, mischievous, yeah. Exactly, and it's just the characteristics are just extravagant and mm -hmm. so, so beautiful. So here's the question. If you're looking at a fae that, that is a part animal type thing, whether it be satyr or cat or centaur, mm -hmm. where would you put a, a, a minotaur? Would that be fae? Minotaur, I would suggest, is not really... Well, it is fae, but it's not, but it's more to the Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that falls in more mythology folklore. Yeah. All right. So what about? So where do we put? Where do we put? Say a talking mm -hmm. cow. On occasion, we happen to have one on the show. A talking, talking cow would cow? be more of an enchanted object than an actual fake. Yeah. Creature, I mean, there except for maybe a very misguided changeling. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, there there has there has been the uh, uh, the occasional you know cow fairies that do roam about, and there are such things you know fairy and a cow. Blah, blah, blah. So, all right, here's the next question. We mentioned Seelie versus Unseelie Court. <laughs> For those who don't know, the quick version, what is Seelie versus Unseelie? Uh, well, Seelie are more... First, I will say, never trust the fairies. Always have a gift for them, and always carry an iron nail. So I should stop asking you questions. Yes. <laughs> See, I'm playing the role of an Unseelie, so therefore I'm derailing your question. I... Yeah, not for it. And I don't follow the rules. Yeah. But uh, I believe this yeah. Seelie thing. Seelie tend to be the more helpful spirits. Like brownies definitely have a plate of honey, milk, and bread for them. They will <laughs> help you clean your house. 
I probably need I to start am doing into that. brownies. You ever miss something, mm. you might want to put that out and see what happens. Yes. <laughs> um, very helpful spirits in fey type. Uh, the unseedly court are more of the tricksters, uh, King Oberon and the like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy definitely is an unseedly. It's just those kind of creatures. That's the primary difference. All right. So here's the next big question. Hmm. Pointy ears or no pointy ears? Pointy ears. Are you crazy? Well, see, I've long heard that the, the, the debate over time, uh, there's been discussion of fairy and lore, but prior to, and, and even Tolkien never really made any mention of it, but as people started to uh, get to the point where they're discussing elves somewhere along the way post-Tolkien, the pointy ears came into effect. There's an historical uh, point for that, most likely. I can't say for certain because my research is still a kind point. of a little... Historical point to the ear. Historically, Humans. people would classify people as changeling or not, not just based on behavior. Now, I'm talking about the old ones, like medieval England, the uh, pagans and the heathens out there who didn't quite join the church just yet. They would tell a changeling from not just their uh, very hyperactive behavior in the child, but... Every once in a while, there would be a child born with pointy ears who would have those characteristics. All right. So, so pointy nation. ears, no pointy ears. The point is, don't ask the elves. I would say, if, either way, like there's got to be some point to elves, and that's what that is. So stick around for more of the show, assuming they let me. <laughs> of course. Hey everyone, Crazy Carl here, and it sounds like you need a date. If you're a fame monster and you need a date, call me, Crazy Carl! Oh, hello there. You wanna go swimming in the lake at midnight? Catch a mermaid? Have a bit of a fish bite? See you in the forest, baby. Hey, Adventures and LARP fans, and uh, welcome to another show. I'm Chris Glover with Courtney Manor. And today, we are joined by Gwal, 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 Gwal Feywolf, who happens to be a fey, hence the name. So, we are having a whole show dedicated to fey, or fairy, for those who haven't played enough D&D. And um, yeah. <laughs> Gwal here has played a little too much fairy. So, <laughs> so we're going to talk, the, first off, when we're talking here, uh, let's talk some about playing fairy in game and, and specifically how what are the things that we can do or people out there can do to really get across a fairy character different of other races well uh first i would definitely say do your research okay always look up the lore look up what is a uh, evil fairy what's a good fairy what do they do what's the characteristics how do they live what does our modern day think of them and what did people back then think of them Okay, or still today, because mm -hmm. we still have Fae. And, and even then, we, we traditionally think of Fae in a fantasy or medieval-ish type genre, but then when you look at the RPG world and things like uh, Shadowrun and things like that, you've got Fae in a modern or future modern type setting, mm -hmm. and, and then you look at things like uh, Warhammer, and you've got Eldar, even though that's not really a LARP, but you still have Fae in, in, in other settings as well. Um, when you're... Once you've done some research and you kind of know some of the back history, what kinds of things do you do as a character to really bring out fairy? Well, I would definitely say um, think of a few things. Do you want to be more the wild and crazy one and move around and just be very wiry? Or do you want to be the superior one and just be alone? Hi. <laughs> Where? <laughs> We're losing our guests here. <laughs> what? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a distraction. <laughs> <sighs> Darling. Hmm. So, all right, all right. Um, Fade into the post. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but throw in as well. I mean, I, when, I guess whenever I've done um, any sorts of role playing, I don't know that I've really gone and, and portrayed a fairy character. I definitely haven't done it very well. Um, you've done some role playing before as well, right? Oh yeah. Uh, you, even though not as much on the LARP side. But mm -hmm. what what kinds of uh, what kinds of fae have you played over time? A fae, um, with the exception of one elf in D and D, most of it has been kind of dwarven. But then again, I've got dwarven right. ancestry. 
most specifically. Yes, I look all sparkly and pretty, but underneath all this, there is a dwarf living at heart. But coming from a personal so you're side... you're an automaton with a dwarf inside. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's how the show suddenly <laughs> took a weird turn. <laughs> no, but um, coming from a personal standpoint, however, I'm pagan, as some of you may have guessed. So fey folk are very prominent in my folklore. Okay. Maybe not quite as exuberant as this, as this guy, but definitely pretty close, especially the Irish Fae. And something that we're going to talk about later is the Unseely and the Seely Court. Okay. Well, so let's, let's we'll get to the Unseely <laughs> and Unseely. But well, we're still talking support. about, yes, um, we, as we're talking about doing some research and things, I know that there are bits of, of fairy in a variety of lore. Uh, oh, yes. Nordic fairy and, mm -hmm. and Irish fairy and European, all the way through uh, Oriental type thing. What are some of the characteristics that seem to be similar across that scream fairy? I would definitely say the mischievousness that um, definitely follows the characteristics of any kind of fae. Uh, every fae that um, I've played or I've had other friends play, I've always seen there's something mysterious and something very mischievous about that, that, that character. And you want to get to know that character because of that. That's, what is that secret that they're holding? And why are they playing those tricks on people? Mm -hmm. yeah, Fae and folklore are very mischievous. Whether you've got uh, the Arabian Jinn, which are a type of Fae folk, you've got, um, of course, the Irish courts, who are very well-known tricksters. You've got <laughs> Pan from uh, Greek mythology and even onto Bacchus and the Dryads and the Naiads, uh, the satyr, yeah, Kronos, satyrs and fauns, which are uh, other types of fae folk, which are really, really interesting from Greece. I think okay. they're actually the more popular kind of fae that mm -hmm. a lot of people that you see like to dress up as, like if they go to a Renaissance fair or a cosplay, mm -hmm. there's, it's just the part, per, uh, part human to part uh, satyr goat is just beautiful. I just really enjoy it. Yeah, so very playful, I see mischievous, yeah. Exactly, and it's just the characteristics are just extravagant and mm -hmm. so, so beautiful. So here's the question. If you're looking at a fae that, that is a part animal type thing, whether it be satyr or cat or centaur, mm -hmm. where would you put a, a, a minotaur? Would that be fae? Minotaur, I would suggest, is not really... Well, it is fae, but it's not, but it's more to the Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that falls in more mythology folklore. Yeah. All okay, right. So what about? So where do we put? Where do we put? Say a talking mm -hmm. cow. On occasion, we happen to have one on the show. A talking, talking cow would cow? be more of an enchanted object than an actual fake. Yeah. Creature, I mean, there except for maybe a very misguided changeling. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, there there has there has been the uh, <coughs> the occasional you know cow fairies that do roam about, and there are such things you know fairy and a cow. Da -da -da. That. So, all right, here's the next question. We mentioned Seely versus Unseely Court. <laughs> For those who don't know, the quick version, what is Seely versus Unseely? Uh, well, Seely are more... First, I will say, never trust the fairies. Always have a gift for them, and always carry an iron nail. So I should stop asking you questions. Yes. <laughs> See, I'm playing the role of an Unseely, so therefore I'm derailing your question. I... Yeah, not for it. And I don't follow the rules. Yeah. But uh, I believe this yeah. Seely thing. Seely tend to be the more helpful spirits. Like brownies definitely have a plate of honey, milk, and bread for them. <laughs> they will help you clean your house. I probably need I to start doing that. I am into brownies. You ever miss something, mm. you might want to put that out. You'll see what happens. Yes. <laughs> um, very helpful spirits in fey type. Uh, the Unseely Court are more of the tricksters, uh, <laughs> King Oberon and the like. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy definitely is an unseely. It's just those kind of creatures. That's the primary difference. All right. So here's the next big question. Hmm. Pointy ears or no pointy ears? Pointy ears. Are you crazy? Well, see, I've long heard that the, the, the debate over time, uh, there's been discussion of fairy and lore, but prior to... And, and even Tolkien never really made any mention of it, but as people started to uh, get to the point where they're discussing elves somewhere along the way post-Tolkien, the pointy ears came into effect. There's an historical uh, point for that, most likely. I can't say for certain because my research is still a kind point. of a little... historical point to the ear. 
historically, yeah. people would classify people as changeling or not, not just based on behavior. Now I'm talking about the old ones, like medieval England, the uh, pagans and the heathens out there who didn't quite join the church just yet. They would tell a changeling from not just their uh, very hyperactive behavior in the child, but every once in a while there would be a child born with pointy ears who would have those characteristics. All right. So, so genetic pointy condition. ears, no pointy ears. The point is don't ask the elves. I would say if either way, like there's got to be some point to elves, and that's what that is. So stick around for more of the show, assuming they let me. Hey everyone, Crazy Carl here, and it sounds like you need a date. If you're a fame monster and you need a date, call me, Crazy Carl. Hi, my name is Gina. I'm here looking for a date. I like fairies and unicorns and um um. Welcome back, Adventures Larping fans, to Crafting Corner. I'm Chris Glover, and uh, we are continuing on in our uh, several-part series on building an arch. Uh, to bring you up to speed, we're building a large props that can be taken, set up on site. This particular one will be an archway that's big enough to go over a door opening or just freestanding out where you need it to be, either in the building that you're using for a larp or outside, whatever the case may be. Now, previously, we have built the first section. We're building this piecemeal so that we can take it apart and make it travel with us. Now, this first section is about three and a half feet tall. Um, we got it all put together there. And at the top of it, we added two holes for these pieces of PVC. Why did we do that? Well, this is the bottom panel for the upper section of our column with the matching two holes. So when it's put together, this will sit down on top and it won't be able to twist and turn and fall off of the base platform. And so what we're doing today is we're building the top section of our column and then above that, an extra small section that will be the base is one side of the actual column piece that stretches across the doorway entrance. And in order to do that and have it sit right on top and not fall off either, we're going to do the same sort of thing that we did here. I've got one panel that will be the top of our upper column, and I've got a second panel that will be the bottom of our cap piece. Before we put it all together, I'm going to go ahead and add some holes in here for more lengths of PVC just like I did on these pieces. Now, they're going to be off center. They don't necessarily have to line up in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the more kind of thrown in there a little bit, the better, so that it doesn't twist around. The one important piece is that since I already have PVC coming up on holes this direction, I want to be sure and not line up with these. So I can do it across, or I can do it at other parts of the board, but as long as these two line up, and that'll be when we insert the other piece of PVC, they'll, they'll be able to line up and they'll all lock up and everything will be beautiful. So I'm going to get started on that. All right, now that I have my holes cut in the top of my upper column and as well in my cap, and I've got them lined up and labeled as to what they are, I'm going to set the cap aside and we'll come back around to it. What, I, what I'm going to do is just like with the bottom half, we're going to go ahead and attach some of our length pieces across, up and down to provide the skeleton for our upper column. Now, one thing that I mentioned before, we don't want the holes to line up even closely. And so I want to be sure that the top here is 90 degrees so that my holes are sure to not line up and that way it won't cause me any problems when I'm putting it together. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Now that we've finished the upper part of our column, we've got our PVC in place. We just slid it into the holes from our bottom, the bottom part of our column. And now let's join these two. So I'm going to slide the holes in the bottom part of this column piece right over the PVC and bam, right into place. 
That way, when we set it up on site, we just put it together and it'll all line up. Now at the moment, the bottom pieces of the PVC are kind of pushing outside of our skeleton. But that's okay. That's exactly what we want at this point. We're going to cover all of that up when we're actually got everything in place. And now I'm going to work on the cap itself and we'll get this all put together. For the cap, we're just going to put it together like the long top pieces, only it's going to be one foot instead of the three and a half that we have these, uh, the other column pieces set for. So we have the two column pieces at three and a half plus the cap at one foot brings a total to an eight foot arch. Now, of course, these uh, dimensions can be uh, altered bigger or smaller as the case may be for your particular application. If you go larger, be sure and do a larger base to accompany it. I'll go ahead and put this together and then we'll get back together to cap it off. Okay, so I've got the cap finished right here. We've got the upper part of the column here. I took it off so it's a little easier for us to get to. Now the PVC I got uh, was pre-cut in five foot lengths just because it was easy to grab and easy to get in the car. About the same price as other PVC, but at five feet, we have a little bit of a problem. This is meant to be a four foot section, so I need to be sure and trim down the PVC. I don't really care about the lower section because there's all kind of space in the, the skeleton of the upper section for it to go to, but in this case, I'm going to chop down the PVC about a foot and then we'll come back together. All right, folks. So we've trimmed our PVC down on the top. Let's get this whole thing put together. There you go. Perfect. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, uh, I'm not quite going to slide this onto the base piece at the moment. Um, I'm actually going to get started making a whole nother side. This is one side of our column all the way to the top. It's going to stand eight feet tall. We're going to be able to play around it and, uh, not worry about damaging it, things like that. Now you may notice that when I'm putting things together, not everything lines up beautiful. And that's okay, I'm not worried about it. Because what we're gonna do once we finish this skeleton of the other side and we have it all ready, is we're going to skin it with a piece of foam insulation and then we're gonna cover the whole thing with a paper mache technique. And so all of the, the mismatch sort of stuff it's going to disappear because we're going to make it look like a big stone col column. Um, and we'll also give some techniques on some other things that you can do if you don't want stones. But the same thing applies. Here's the skeleton. Here is our take apart column. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get to work on some more. Come back on further episodes and we'll uh, put this whole thing together and get working on some more pieces.